thank you so much for having me. As she said, my name is Sophie Dolan, and um, I'm going to be talking to you guys about diet and nutrition. Um, I should let you know that I, for the past six years, um, I've been working as a pediatric dietitian, and so a lot of my, or all of my IBD experience is in pediatrics. Um, and now that I own my own practice, I'm seeing some adults and some pedi pediatric patients. And I was living in Boston for the past six years, so working at Boston Children's Hospital in their IBD center. Um, so you'll notice we've got a lot of colorful slides and some more kid-friendly slides, but hopefully they will help you guys out. Um, and we, we're going to kind of, I'm going to try to hit, hit the main things about nutrition and IBD. This is something I could talk about for probably about two hours. Oh. So first, I always like to start with talking about the pathology of IBD. You know, as you guys know, we don't know exactly what causes IBD. Um, we know that it is really multifactorial. Of course, genetics plays a really big role, um, our immune response. And then what we're really going to be focusing on today is the environmental factors, right? So we're really, we're going to talk about the, our diets today, how, our lifestyles, um, and we know that something that they've looked into is that a more Western style of eating, Western style diet, has been associated with a higher risk of having inflammatory bowel disease. So, you know, I know um, a lot of times people ask me, well, I'm on medications. Why are you, why do you even care about my diet? Like, I, I'm feeling good. And so, but medications and a healthy diet together can help you um, to stay feeling well. You know, they're kind of doing a little bit of different things. So just because you're on medications doesn't necessarily mean we don't want to um, think about diet as well. So nutrition is so individualized, and especially for um, inflammatory bowel disease. So every single patient that I see has different needs, right? Whether their their preferences, where their disease is, um, you know, their culture, all of these things really play a role. And so unfortunately, we can't. I'm not giving any individual nutrition advice today. This we're really going to be talking about general inflammatory bowel disease. But nutrition is super important for multiple different reasons. You know, our patients with inflammatory bowel disease are at a high risk of malabsorption. Um, of course, as a pediatric dietitian, I'm thinking a lot about growth and development, but that's also very important for our adults as far as, you know, malnutrition, weight loss, um, you know, your energy levels. How are you feeling? How are you doing throughout the day? Are you, how are you nourishing yourself? And of course, we want to make sure that we're supporting a really healthy microbiome, um, which we are learning more about and we'll get more into. Here are some of the common nutrition concerns that I see. It, it ranges, right? There might be weight loss, maybe there's rapid weight gain, um, certain nutrition deficiencies, picky eating, texture issues, um, poor appetite. Um, there's just many different, many different things that a lot of my patients um, will face. And there's a lot of information out there, right? I'm sure I don't know if, you know, your friend's giving you advice or, you know, you've looked on the internet, on Instagram, on TikTok. There's so many people trying to give it nutrition advice these days, and it can be really overwhelming. Um, so I'm hoping I can give you some good sound nutrition uh, advice as far as IBD goes. As you may know, they're doing a lot of research on, on how diet is impacting um, IBD. And so I do use diet therapy as I call it, an inflammatory bowel disease. And so I've, there's many different diets that they're looking at. And so I try to categorize those in three different groups. Um, so there's treatment, there's adjunct therapy, and then there's a dietary therapy that I use for symptom control. Um, so the treatment and the adjunct therapy, those are, you know, and all of the dietary therapy that I use is always, you know, with, with the gastroenterologist, with the provider. Um, but there is some research to suggest that um, the diet called the exclusive enteral nutrition, which is a full liquid diet, can be used in, in patients with Crohn's disease. Typically, it's going to be in pediatric disease. Um, and then the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And so when I say it can be used as treatment, there is some data to suggest that some um, this is helping patients get into remission. It's helping them keep their inflammation down. Um, can be used as adjunct therapy as well. So maybe in addition to, to a medication, we're using a very specific diet. Um, and we're not going to get into all the specifics of these. And then, for, and then for other reasons, I would use some of the other diets under symptom control, whether you are in remission and we're still not feeling very good. Um, maybe we need a low lactose diet, low FODMAP diet. So there's a lot out there. But for the sake of our conversation today, we're really going to focus on a general helpful diet with um, a strong emphasis on, on our gut health. So of course we have to talk about the microbiome. Who's heard of that term? It's kind of starting to be a buzzword. I'm sure you've all have heard about it. And so when you hear the word microbiome, they're really um, referring to the whole community of bugs and bacteria or pathogens that are all throughout our GI system. And a lot of 
times it's referred to as a fingerprint. You know, we all have different fingerprints, you know, whether it depends on where we live, how old we are, what medications are we on, how we were born, um, of course, what our diets look like. And so we're really, science is getting very interested in what's happening in our microbiome. What kind of bacteria do we have? And perhaps some of these bacteria that are in our gut, they may be more be, be more harmful, and then some actually may be more helpful in how diet is associated with those. Um, and that we're learning that a higher diversity in our microbiome perhaps may help decrease inflammation. So here's kind of a quick list of some commonly questioned foods that people ask me about a lot. And again, I want to reiterate that, you know, um, Every single patient is very different. I'm really talking about when you're in remission and you're feeling really well. This is not if you are in a flare. This is not if you have stricturing disease, you know, if you've had certain surgeries. So I'm sorry we can't get super specific. Um, but most of my patients who are feeling well are doing really good. They can continue to have, you know, raw vegetables or fruits with seeds on them or even um, their fruits with, with the skins on them. Um, of course, I have some asterisks, so make sure you see those. So we would want to avoid raw vegetables and fruits with seeds and skins if you do have stricturing. Um, but most people can enjoy dairy products to an extent and be okay. And there's really no food that I'm going to say you should never, ever eat, right? It's really, it's not that black and white. Um, and then the things in the yellow, these are some food products that we just want to be cautious with. These foods tend to, if maybe we overdo it on them, they may end up causing abdominal pain or causing some unwanted symptoms. Um, you should always, always defer to the GI doctors that I'm working with in terms of like seeds and nuts and popcorn and what you can do, um, what you can do there. But ultimately, the most important piece is really listening to your body, connecting to your body, knowing what foods may be um, upsetting your, your system. So next, we're going to get into kind of patterns of eating. So, and I'm talking about, you know, what, um, what we're eating every day and every week and every month and what we're really relying on for our nutrients is really important. And so we, there are some patterns of eating that may be associated with more inflammation in our bodies. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So if our diet is very, um, is very heavy in the saturated and trans fats, so if we're having a lot of maybe um, high fat meat products or um, bolognese and higher fat beef, um, you know, pork, if we're doing a lot of more like processed meats, that might be something to think about. Um, you also find trans fats in more product like bakery goods and those types of things. We want to be careful with how much of that we're taking in. So high added sugar intake. So maybe if we're doing a lot of cookies or candies or juices, sugary beverages, um, that's something we want to think about decreasing. That's obviously a big thing when with my pediatric patients. I want to make sure they're not having, you know, something super sugary that would take the place of a snack time or a meal where they should really be getting something that's super nourishing. Refined grains, and what I mean by that is if our diets are really heavily um, on, you know, the white breads or um, more, you know, we want the, the, the key here is really about diversifying your grains So making sure you got rice and you can do, um, maybe you try, you know, a, a quinoa or potatoes, oatmeal. So really trying to diversify the types of grains that we're getting in. We want to be cautious with the ultra processed foods. I think a lot of, um, a lot of science and research are looking into what are, when we're eating these processed foods, what's happening to the lining of our gut. And a lot of, some of this information here is really, they're just kind of scratching the surface as far as research is concerned, but they are finding that perhaps if we're eating foods that are heavily processed with specific additives and emulsifiers, perhaps that's making, um, that's creating more of that harmful, the bacteria in the gut. And then a low fiber intake. So if our diets, if we're not getting enough, you know, fruits and vegetables and beans and legumes and those whole grains, um, then that perhaps may be causing more inflammation down the road. So we're going to just talk quickly. A lot of people ask me about the emulsifiers and the food additives and where you may find those. They tend to be, so an emulsifier is, is, is an um, additive they're adding into our foods to keep things mixed together. And so you may find them in things like an ice cream or sometimes on a deli meat. Um, and so I think one of the takeaways is looking at our ingredient list, right? Less is more. The fewer things that are in the food ingredient list, the better off we're going to be when we can, right? We, these are not things we need to become super obsessed with. These are just things that um, it's nice to be aware of. So then what's the opposite, right? What should we, what should we be thinking about? So here are some patterns of eating. 
that are going to help kind of decrease, maybe fight against that inflammation long term. We want to think about our lean protein options. So whether that's, you know, chicken and turkey, eggs, seafood, tofu, the omega-3 fatty acids, which are helpful. They're considered the anti-inflammatory um, fat. So those, you find that in olive oil and avocado and certain nuts and seeds. And I'll show you some pictures on the next slide. We want to think about our fiber and our complex carbohydrates. Some examples may be oatmeal, rice, potatoes, beans, and legumes as tolerated in many fruits and vegetables. So like I said, I really like pictures. So here are some nice photos of some omega-3 fats. So you'll see olives, uh, walnuts, guacamole or avocado, um, certain types of fish such as salmon. Then many, many ways to get your fiber in. So whether it's beans or legumes, um, it's potatoes, it's fruits, it's vegetables, and then of course some lean protein options. And here are just some extra kind of other suggestions on how maybe we can decrease some of the sugar. So thinking about what we're, what we're drinking. So if we're drinking juice or soda, perhaps we can dilute the juice with a little water, or maybe we can, you know, measure out one or two tablespoons of the juice and mix it with a seltzer. For sweet treats, so thinking maybe, well, first off, when are we eating our sweet treats? Like if we're eating them because we're hungry, maybe we try to have a healthy snack like a, you know, a piece of toast with peanut butter or something instead. Um, you know, what kind of snacks are we having? Can we do an apple and peanut butter or add some fruit to our cereal for some, um, for some more natural sweetness? And then thinking about using more herbs and, and spices and seasonings for, for your different types of cooking. And so working towards decreasing and limiting our processed foods, I know this is super challenging, especially when we're on the go and they're very easy to get. Um, and, you know, I will say some of this, you know, we want, of course, more frozen food, um, more processed foods, these are going to tend to have more of those additives. But even, again, the most important piece is really looking at our ingredient list, right? Less is more. Just because something is frozen or canned is, by no means does that mean you shouldn't eat it. It is about what is in there. So trying to find the thing with the fewer ingredients. Um, and again, like I said, it's really about the pattern of eating, right? What are we relying on day in and out for our, for our nutrition? Does our day look like this? That's nice and nice and well balanced. There's a little bit of everything. You've got protein, you've got fruits, you've got vegetables, you've got some really great complex carbohydrates. Or is our day looking a little bit more like this? This may be, this is a little bit more sugar, um, a little bit more refined grains, and it may, may be leaving you even actually a little bit hungry. So we want to find something in the middle. So they're doing some research, like I said, and so perhaps a diet resembling the Mediterranean diet might be the best. I really like this pyramid. They, um, this is very readily available on the Old Ways, on the Old Ways website. It's a really great resource for the Mediterranean diet. Um, they're looking, you know, as you guys probably know, the Mediterranean diet is, is known for um, kind of finding, fighting against chronic um, diseases. And, and helpful for longevity. And I really love the pyramid because the most important things are at the bottom, the least important things are at the top. And I love that the bottom is really about connecting with one another, you know, trying to eat together with others. Um, and, you know, our mental health play a big role in our overall health. And so with the Mediterranean diet, they break it down into like enjoy what we enjoy daily versus more infrequently or moderately. So daily, we want to think about having our whole grains, our fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, helpful fats, herbs and spices. Twice a week, we want to think about getting some sort of fish or seafood. More moderately, thinking um, about dairy and eggs and poultry more moderately. And then more infrequently, um, want to limit the, the red meat and the sweets. So pre and probiotics, this is a big kind of a big question that comes up a lot. And so I try to encourage my clients to really get these naturally. There's not a lot of super strong data to suggest using um, probiotics in um, inflammatory bowel disease. So I like to get them through food. So prebiotics, when, if you've ever heard of that term, that is it's just feeding the good bacteria. So when we eat these things, it's basically the good bacteria and our microbiomes are getting very excited. They're eating them, um, and that's helping create more, more, um, more helpful bacteria. So that's naturally found in many different things that are listed there. And then the probiotic is actually a live bacteria that when you ingest that, it's just giving you more good live bacteria. You can find that in fermented foods, um, such as, or like a kefir or a sauerkraut. You can also get them in yogurt, um, kimchi, pickles, and a lot of different 
um, areas. And there is, um, there is one probiotic that can be helpful in ulcerative colitis and a condition called pouchitis. So that's basically really the only probiotic that I know of that's really shown some really good um, results. So quickly, we'll talk about some dietary suggestions for when maybe we're not feeling so great. So everyone's flair looks really different, um, so we can't get into the super nitty gritty. But if when we're not feeling well, I would usually recommend more of a kind of a GI gentle diet. So maybe considering softening the texture of the foods that you're eating. So instead of eating the raw vegetables, cook them down or puree them, make a soup, make a stew, um, make a smoothie. Those can be just easier, easier on the gut, easier to, to get in. Um, peel the skins off your potatoes and apples and cucumbers. Uh, making sure to really stay very well hydrated. I think that's something some of my patients forget to do is to make sure they're drinking plenty of fluids and maybe trying to have more small frequent meals and, and if you are usually someone who eats maybe three bigger meals. And then quickly when we're on steroids. Of course, feeling extra hungry is very normal, right? And so something that can help that is to try to include some lean protein at your meals. That's going to help maybe stabilize your blood sugar a little bit better and keep you full for longer. Um, think about maybe low, lower salt products. Don't forget your fruits and vegetables. And I think that as we kind of discussed earlier in, in the conference, thinking about calcium. So when you're on steroids for long term, that can have some bone density effects. So making sure you're um, combating that with calcium rich foods such as whether that's yogurt or milk, um, you know, cheese, maybe it's orange juice that's been fortified with calcium can, can be helpful. So when to see a specialized IBD dietitian? I think if you're interested in learning more about some of these specific diets, that might be, might be something to think about. If you are facing, you know, poor growth or poor weight gain or rapid weight gain or there's food triggers, or um, if you're not sure what to eat, um, these can all be some, some reasons to, to find a dietitian. Um, they, to, I, I like to recommend to my patients to even check in with the dietitian at least yearly. I think it's important to make sure we're looking at, are you getting enough you know, iron? Are you getting enough protein? Are you just getting everything that your body needs? And the fun fact that a lot of insurance plans will actually cover nutrition visits, and it may actually be completely free to you, so I would encourage you to look into your plan. So a few takeaways. So there's not one specific diet that's going to be right for you. Um, you know, less is more, like I've said. The fewer the ingredients, the better. That's kind of an easy rule of thumb. We want you to have as wide of a variety of a diet as you can. Um, and then, you know, at keeping variety and eating and cooking more from home when possible and trying to limit those, those processed foods. And one other thing that I didn't include in the PowerPoint, I've talked a lot about what to eat, but I think something else to think about is how we eat. So, you know, making sure that we're taking time, we're sitting down at a table, we're eating slowly, we're chewing well, you know, we're not going too long without, with periods without eating, because then the next time we eat, maybe we eat a little too much and that upsets our stomach. So also thinking about um, how, are we, how are we eating as well. So here are a few kind of resources and, and references. A, a pretty new resource for nutrition is the www.nt4ibd.org. Would highly recommend you guys checking out that website. It has some really phenomenal um, resources there. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions at the end and happy to connect if anybody has any nutrition questions. Thanks so much.